most of us recognize that uh, what corporations do have externalities, as we economists say, have an impact uh, on innocent bystanders. And, uh, uh, and then, and so this raises the question of maybe we want to regulate that impact. So that's an angle of efficiency. Then some people also would like to see corporations play a different role, uh, a, a, a social role of some kind. Uh, so that uh, goes to some kind of redistributive role. And whichever path you want to take or, or angle you want to take, the, both, uh, both these desires raise the question of uh, how do you then nudge corporations to do the right thing, whatever you, you, you think the right thing is. And so there are several tools, obviously, that are all being used. One is uh, regulatory tools. That's why we have regulators. Another tool is legal tools, and so we see lawsuits. And then there's the tool of governance, and this is the tool, as I understand it, that we're talking about in this conference. The question then arises, is acting on governance uh, as a tool for uh, uh, regulating the corporation, is this um, the right way to go, and is it even possible? And so to answer, these, to answer these questions, we need some kind of a model of what governance is doing now. Uh, hence, this conference, the purpose of the corporation. So what forces uh, currently does the corporation respond to? And that is a question that has been asked uh, yesterday. Uh, there are economic forces. This is for sure there, the idea being that corporations need money, financial resources, and these are scarce. And so those who give these financial resources have a say in what the corporation does, bargaining power. So I call this an economic rationale. Corporations also respond to public politics. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we heard yesterday from Senator Feingold about the ways that corporations do respond uh, to, uh, to those pressures. Then. Corporations also respond to private politics. That's a term of art a little bit, but the idea is that uh, uh, there are um, uh, uh, activists that have the power to influence the corporation through non-market activity. And the panel yesterday, uh, Murray's panel on activist pressure, uh, talked about that. Then there is corporate legal structure. and. And so there's an open question, I think, which many in this room are interested in, whether uh, the legal structure is, in fact, a constraint or not. And we're going to hear more about this in the panel today, uh, now. Uh, and then there's ethical considerations, overarching ethical consideration. And Jensen's talk yesterday discussed this. So today's panel, today's first panel, is on legal structure. And uh, is, is, is legal structure a constraint on what uh, the corporation can do, and therefore, is it the right place to intervene? Good morning. My name is Steve Prolstein. Um, I'm a columnist uh, at the Washington Post and um, professor at George Mason University. I'm going to moderate this conversation today um, with, uh, with a pretty distinguished panel. Um, we have uh, at uh, your left, my right, um, <coughs> Dwight Hutchins. <coughs> I think is a Kellogg graduate. Indeed, 91. 91. Uh, and uh, is, uh, manages the public sector practice um, at Accenture. If, uh, if you don't like the way the Department of Homeland Security is running today, you can blame twice. <laughs> um, next to him is um, uh, Bart Houlihan, who is the founder of B Labs, uh, which is the sort of underwriter's laboratory for corporate behavior, um, and uh, he's a uh, recovering investment banker. Um, next to him is Donna Dabney, who um, is head of the corporate governance program at the conference board, um, which uh, speaks for um, the well-behaved corporations uh, in the United States, and she's a former corporate secretary at. Um, Alcoa and Reynolds. And uh, immediately next to me is uh, Bernie Black, uh, who teaches at the Northwestern Law School uh, right next door and has uh, been a longtime expert um, in, the, 
the laws of corporations and securities. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of them uh, to uh, take about four minutes and just explain to us, well, actually I wanted to start with something else. <coughs> I, I wanted to start with a poll, um, uh, and this is just an informal poll, and I'm going to ask you to make um, one of those unfair choices, which is that you can only pick one. Okay. So I want you, we're going to talk about why companies don't behave the way maybe they should, and why they don't behave maybe the way we would like them to, and how we can fix that. And so I'm going to give you um, six choices. You have to pick only one. Which of these approaches would you put most emphasis on? Would you put the most emphasis on regulation, government regulation? Would you put the most emphasis on corporate disclosure, making companies disclose more about what they do? Presumably, that would cause that might cause them to change their behavior. Um, would you focus on changing? corporate charter or the case law having to, that under which corporations uh, exist and um, that direct, perhaps direct the behavior of um, their executives and their directors? Um, would you reform the world of finance, um, which uh, uh, has some impact on the way corporations behave, the people who invest all of our money? Um, would you reform uh, the financial sector? Would you give shareholders more power so that they can uh, make sure that, that they can have a better uh, ability to make sure corporations do what they think is in um, best, their best interest? Um, or would you just focus on social norms? That's a sort of vague thing. Uh, somehow change the, the environment so that people behave better because they're shamed into it. Um, mm -hmm. that they, it won't be socially acceptable. Um, that you might do this in law schools or business schools, you might do this through journalism, you might do it through the churches and temples, but whatever. Um, that's a, just a sort of a general uh, category. So I'll just, um, let's start with regulation. How many people here think regulation is the way to go? One, two, three, four. We have four for regulation. Uh, how many people think uh, disclosure is the way to go? I think I've got 17. How many think uh, changes in charters and case law uh, is the way to go? Okay, zero. All right. How many think reform the this financial sector? One, two, three, four, six, seven. Okay, seven. How many think more shareholder power? One, two. And now Minnow isn't here yet, but I'm sure she <laughs> Three. And how many people think, as squishy as it is, you've got to focus on social norms? One, two, three. Okay. Um, we're going to do this again at the end, um, because uh, I've already talked to our panel, so I know um, that actually some of them think one or more of these is more important. We'll see if they can change um, your mind in any respect. So, um, I'm going to start actually with Bart, um, uh, as you'll see for maybe an obvious reason. Go ahead, Bart. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Great. So, um, let me first begin with a disclaimer, which is I am not an attorney. I've never been to law school, it's not my area of expertise. I consider myself first and foremost an entrepreneur. Uh, I ran an athletic footwear company called And One for 13 years that we sold in 2005. It was a basketball footwear and apparel company. And at the back end of that 13-year run, there were some things that were very clear to me. One was that business is, in my opinion, the most powerful force in society. That secondly, if harnessed appropriately, it can be an incredible force for good. And that thirdly, the current corporate structure isn't quite set up to support a company that's trying to scale something beyond just revenues and profitability. They're trying to scale purpose, mission. 
Uh, and that brought me to the work I do currently. I run a nonprofit. It's called B Lab. I, I'm a, one of the three co founders, and we have a pretty simple mission. It's trying to harness the power of capitalism to create change. We focus on entrepreneurs by serving them principally who are trying to use their business to solve a social or environmental problem. They might be trying to alleviate poverty, rebuild communities, create great places to work, preserve the environment, a whole host of things that they're trying to do. And they believe that business can be used for a higher purpose. We serve them in three different ways, but I'm only going to focus in two uh, today around the nature of this particular conversation. The first is who you're familiar with would lead a certification for a building. Okay, so it's a, it's a certification for a green building. We're essentially lead for business. We certify the entire corporation as a good business, a company that's both making money and making a difference uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. That corporate certification is called Certified B Corporations. We have about 700 Certified B Corporations. Uh, they're in 60 different industries. 24 different countries, ranging from multi-billion dollar companies down to sole proprietors and everything in between. We then ask those 700 companies to work with us to create a new legally recognized corporate form, like a C or an S or an LLC. It's for a for-profit company. It's called a benefit corporation. Fundamentally, it's removing the legal impediments from companies that want to both create shareholder value and social value simultaneously. It gives them a way to preserve mission indefinitely and total legal clarity for directors, officers, and investors that the company's about more than just making money. That new legislation has, uh, we've been working on it for about 18 months. It's passed in 13 states. Um, it's been introduced or in the works in another 18 this year. I imagine we'll get about a dozen of those by the end of this year. Um, importantly, it is a idea that uh, it gets wonderful bipartisan support. And uh, we've had, I think, 13 unanimous votes so far. Uh, it passes typically without much opposition. A uh, reason being is that uh, the right loves this because it's trying to get business more engaged in solving uh, social and environmental problems instead of government. And the left loves it because it's focused on climate change and disparity and wealth and other issues. And as a result, we often get the farthest right and farthest left uh, sponsors to co-sponsor this bill. Um, it has now been introduced in Chile it's being considered in Colombia. It's being considered in Spain. Uh, so it is moving outside of uh, the US borders, this new corporate form. Uh, if I back all the way up and say, why the hell am I doing all this? At the core of the idea is to try to create a gold standard, you know, a, a, a business that is as innovating in the ways they're using capitalism to address some problem. And in the process, through, I think, like five out of seven of those up there, not including regulation, essentially try to redefine success in business so that in a generation we're all measuring business not exclusively on their bottom line, but all companies are working not to be best in the world, but be best for the world. That's our mission. That's what we hope to accomplish. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Donna, why don't you go next since uh, I put you at probably at the other pole of that. Yeah. I already told Bart I was going to disagree with everything he had to say. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I um, I love an investment banker with a heart. You know, I don't know if I've ever met one before, but um, <laughs> but um, actually, um, I don't see any reason why we need a new corporate form. Uh, you know, I'm a corporate lawyer. I've been a corporate lawyer for 33 years, and I'm not uh, I'm not an academic. I'm a practitioner. Uh, but I've used the, you know, the normal C Corp corporation form for many years, and there's no restriction under corporate law uh, for the purpose of the corporation. That's completely a myth, as uh, Lynn Stout has very clearly pointed out. Uh, if you take a look at what the details of corporate law are, uh, you first of all have the state law um, where you incorporate your corporation. And most uh, public companies in the United States are incorporated under Delaware, so let's just use that as a proxy for state law. 
Under Delaware law, there is nothing, there is not one word in the statute that says that you have to maximize shareholder value, nothing. The charters of public companies say um, you can run the company for whatever purpose you want. If you look at charters of public companies, what you see is uh, basically in modern charters today, it says it can be run for any lawful purpose. Uh, if you look at older charters, um, you'll see a, a whole litany of things that the company can do, but it basically gets down to the same thing. You can run the company for any lawful purpose. So there's no restriction under the current system of corporate law in the United States that says you can't run a company uh, for the benefit of other stakeholders besides the shareholders. Then you have to look at case law. And if you look at what did the judges interpret the statutory rules to require, um, it's very clear under Delaware corporate law that the business judgment rule prevails. And what that means is that judges are not going to substitute their decision for a business person's decision. And that makes eminent sense to me because judges went to law school, then they were trial lawyers usually, and then they became judges. Did they ever run a business? No. So why should judges uh, you know, substitute their judgment for somebody who has run a business? And so it's a very sensible law that has uh, many, many cases that support it. It's unquestioned, it's solid, um, and it is the law of corporate law in the United States that the business judgment rule prevails and directors who make a decision will be protected if they exercise their business judgment in an informed manner and they don't have a conflict of interest. Now, there are only a couple of small exceptions to that general rule, and I think those small exceptions have been the tail that wags the dog. So, first of all, this thing called the Revlon exception. And what that says is if you, as a board, decide that you want to sell your company or you get an unsolicited offer and you decide to pursue it, then your only, um, your only decision after that is to maximize the price that you get. And the reason for that is because you're no longer interested in engaging your employees or delighting your customers or any of the societal kinds of things that you might have been engaged in before because you've already made a decision you're not going to be managing it anymore. Somebody else is. And that somebody else will figure out what their purpose is once they acquire the company. So in that situation only, when you actually made a decision that you're not going to be in that business anymore, then, um, then you have to take the shareholders' interest to maximize their wealth. Uh, so that's a very clear rule, but it's a narrow rule for a particular situation. Now recently, we have had a case that a number of uh, commentators and academic articles have been written about, which also is a very narrow situation, but some people are saying, well, it's, it's kind of carving out and cutting back on the business judgment rule. I don't believe that's the case. But here's the facts. Um, the case had to do with Craigslist. And so Craigslist was a private company. It had two, uh, two major shareholders, Craig, uh, who <laughs> formed Craigslist, <laughs> and his partner, James. And so Jim and Craig um, formed a, a corporation, and they brought in a third party, which was a subsidiary of eBay. Uh, to be their third party, um, and, and I believe was their financial backer. And so the Craigslist philosophy, their purpose was to serve society. And in fact, they had a specific purpose not to make profit. And so uh, Craig and Jim got upset with eBay because eBay started competing with them, which was perfectly legal for eBay to do because there was no contract that said eBay couldn't uh, compete with them. So uh, Craig and Jim got together and decided they were going to implement what is commonly called a poison pill, uh, a shareholder rights plan, uh, <coughs> more uh, neutrally described. But, but what this pill did was basically prevent eBay from changing the public purpose of the corporation, which was uh, to serve the public, but not necessarily to make profit. And so eBay sued them, and the judge in that case said that Craig and Jim should have not, he, he invalidated the, the poison pill, and, and, and he did that on the basis of a higher level of scrutiny when he reviewed what they were doing. And this is very important. 
it's important for lawyers, but for non-lawyers, I mean, you would know the difference between a criminal trial and a civil trial, where in a criminal trial you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, whereas in a civil trial you just prove it by a preponderance of the evidence, big difference. In this case, it was the same kind of concept, where because they had implemented a rights plan, there was a conflict of interest. Jim and, and Craig were basically trying to oppress the minority shareholder, and that's what this case is about. They were trying to get back at eBay, and they were trying to oppress them in, in a way that, that really rose a, co a conflict of interest between Craig and Jim on the one hand, and you know they were trying to protect their interest uh, beyond their own lives, actually. So, uh, Donna, can I just interrupt you because yeah. you're, you're a bit beyond the four minutes. It, the, your point is that the law is not a constraint now, that shareholder value can mean lots of things to different people, and the law is not constraining in, in, in any way in constraining corporations from behaving um, in whatever way they think is consistent with their purpose and the interests of, of their shareholders. That's right. I'm sorry to have gone so long on this, but I just wanted to make the point that the business judgment rule is, is a very firm rule, and because of it, um, corporations have absolutely uh, no impediment uh, to doing uh, business the way they want to and to implementing any purpose that they think is particularly the purpose that they want their corporation to, to do. The only exception to that is in, in rare cases, and that's my okay. point. Bernie. All right, so I, I, never, I never want to be boring. Um, <laughs> I, I, did, I don't uh, think anyone's going to ever um, do that. We did reach a deal with Steve that we'd limit to four minutes and he'd come back to us, so I'm going to try to honor that and just introduce a problem and give details later. Um, so a lot of corporate social responsibility is how you make what you sell or maybe what you do with your profits once you make them. I want to speak about a related topic that you could call CSR, you could call business ethics, which is what limits should there be on what you sell and how you sell it. Um, describe a problem, we can think separately about solutions. I want to focus on complex financial transactions and on the uh, commercial banks and the institutions formerly known as investment banks um, that structure uh, these transactions. Uh, most financial transactions are zero sum before transaction costs, negative sum after transaction costs. Um, that doesn't mean none of them have value, but it you know sort of raises the stakes. I want to ask, when is it unethical to enter into a zero-sum transaction that you know or darn well should know is bad for your counterparty? Uh, sometimes this is fine. Uh, a classic example is trading in stock markets. If through diligence or intelligence um, you're better informed than others, you can profit by trading with them. We think this is fine, even good. Uh, but it depends on two things. First, you came by your informational advantage honestly. Uh, if you didn't, we call that insider trading and consider this criminal behavior. Uh, second, you didn't go out and talk a less informed counterparty into the trade. Um, they came to the trade voluntarily. I want to focus on the second condition. You're smart. Your counterparty is not. Um, you go and seek out the counterparty precisely because they are not smart. Uh, anyone who was uh, wouldn't trade with you on the terms you were offering. Um, and you convince them to do something which is highly profitable for you and demonstrably stupid for them. Um, we're coming out of a major financial crisis which was uniquely made in Wall Street and inflicted on everyone else. Um, it was sparked by non-prime mortgage lending, uh, which in critical aspects met these criteria. Um, smart but um, unethical investment bankers whose jobs, bonuses, and culture um, all told them anything to make a buck, and a million bucks is even better. Um, they concealed the problems with non-prime loans. Uh, they found fools to buy products that they never should have sold and which no informed buyer uh, would have bought. Uh, to be sure, uh, some of the buyers wanted to be fooled. The credit rating agencies for sure wanted to be fooled. Uh, but I want to focus on, uh, on the bankers. I, I don't mean to suggest that bad banker behavior was limited to non-prime securitization. That was just the most uh, important recent example. And I'll stop there to stay within my four minutes and come back with more examples. <laughs> okay. Dwight. Wow, after that, uh, <laughs> tough act to follow. 
Um, so, so I bring two or three perspectives here. Uh, as Steve said, I help run our strategy and sustainability practice at Accenture. Um, so coming from a point of view of helping our clients, corporate and, and governmental, uh, achieve their sustainability as well as their overall profit maximizing objectives. Uh, and also bring the perspective from, from our firm, um, 260,000 people around the world, 25 billion uh, in revenue, uh, and, and the work that we are doing uh, to make sure that we are a sustainable business and, and improving our performance there. Uh, and I guess the third piece is uh, from a, a perspective of the research that we've done. So for instance, we just did a study that showed that roughly 80% of um, executives around the world see uh, pursuing sustainable strategies as key to their business growth. Uh, and so we try to stay on top of these things in order to find out, quite frankly, where our clients are going and how we can help them get there. Uh, what you will hear or didn't hear in that is I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I've never played one on television. Uh, and sitting here uh, with, with the rest of the panel, uh, it is, it is uh, you know, not, not a good idea for me to even uh, pretend to know the law. Um, what I can tell you is that in the work that we do uh, with our clients, um, you know, helping them achieve their objectives, primarily it's about profitability. Uh, increasingly, it's profitability within a sustainable context, um, but that context is, is not that clear. And quite frankly, a lot of it is driven by some of the things that we talked about yesterday, whether it's pressure groups, activist groups, uh, or you know perhaps legislation and regulation, uh, and so from from our view and quite frankly from our experience, um, the main focus, <coughs> excuse me, is pursuing profitability. What I learned and reaffirmed this morning is that um, you know the law allows uh, the pursuit of other objectives. Um, the focus is on profitability and growth, right? So um, changing that focus from profitability and growth, you know, is, you know, I think it, it, it goes, you know, at the, the heart of, you know, our capitalist society. So that is not a, a small undertaking. Um, so then the question then becomes, how do you get a company or an entire ecosystem that is focused for a particular pursuit, whether you think it's good or bad, to include other components to that pursuit? Uh, and as was stated earlier, you know, whether it's the product you sell, you can't sell this product, uh, you can't make that product the way you make it, or you can't treat your suppliers and employees the way you treat them, uh, that is a conversation for, I think, regulation uh, and, and social norms. Um, let me uh, go back to you, Bart, and ask you, um, having heard what we did, um, if shareholder value is if a narrow definition of shareholder value, meaning getting the stock price up in the short term, mm -hmm. if that is not legally required, then why, um, and, and, and we've talked about this, you understand that, then why bother uh, going to the different charter? Sure. Um, uh, what's, what's, uh, why not just uh, do a little public education on, on, uh, on the current charter? Yeah. So uh, I think to much to Donna's chagrin, we agree almost on everything. <laughs> we agree on, on, on almost everything. The business judgment uh, rule does give you great latitude to consider things other than uh, profit maximization. Uh, all that is absolutely true. Uh, the place where uh, she and I uh, disagree mostly is she calls a change of control a rare occasion. 100% of every business has a change of control. Everyone. There's nobody who lives into perpetuity. There's no shareholder group that is going to own that company forever. And so fundamentally, uh, for us, the exact rare instance that Donna agrees that you must maximize shareholder value is the only, uh, the only time that this matters most. Because it is at that moment when the entrepreneur who has built the company that has mission is trying to maintain that mission is forced at that juncture to not consider mission. It's completely off the table. Can't even be considered. So first, principally, what we're trying to do is create a vehicle that allows a company 
to maintain its social and environmental purpose. And at the moment of change of control, if you have another offer that's a distinctly higher price, you have to sell to whomever that is, regardless if they're going to maintain that purpose of the company. There are a growing set of investors who care about this. When they put their money in, they want them into a mission-aligned business that has a focus beyond just shareholder value. They want to make sure that when they exit that business, the mission that they were trying to grow is maintained. So that, that's A, change of control. And then B, uh, to uh, Dwight's point, we have a huge cultural problem here. We have a huge cultural problem uh, where uh, though the law gives you flexibility to con consider other stakeholders, uh, the pragmatic examples, uh, it, I've been doing this for five years. I have not found a single corporate attorney who will write me an opinion saying that the company can consider something beyond shareholder value. That if there's a clear trade-off between shareholder value and uh, environmental benefits or shareholder value and community growth, not one. Uh, on top of that, the Chancery Court in Delaware pretty much has affirmed several times that the principal focus of business. I'm going to read you a quote from Chancellor uh, St Strine. Corporations exist to generate stockholder wealth and that the interests of constituencies are incidental and subordinate to that primary concern. So both from a cultural perspective, application of the law, and change of control, if there is an entrepreneur and investor who wants to create and support a company that's doing something beyond maximizing shareholder value, they don't have that opportunity today in current corporate law. So, um, Donna, I'd like you to respond to that, and, and Roberta, you can jump in too, uh, but respond to it, but also deal with the difficult problem that I think um, is in your position, which is if the law doesn't make people do this, why do they all think they have to do it? And if they all think they have to do it, doesn't, isn't in effect real, whether the law is that way or not? And so how are you, gonna, uh, how are you going to deal with that as well as twice? Um, a little more precise legal objections. Um, I, th I think that's exactly the right point. Um, I don't think there's anything in the law uh, really that requires you to maximize shareholder value, but it is a very common norm. And if you asked um, in the last 10 years, if you ask any CEO in the U.S., you know, what's their, what's their purpose, what, what are they running the company for, they would probably say something along those lines. Uh, and that's because it's become sort of accepted wisdom. It's repeated all the time in the press. Um, you have a number of business school graduates and economists who, who believe that that's the case. But as, as I said earlier, it's not a legal requirement. But it is becoming and has become a cultural sort of norm or expectation. And where did this come from? Well, I think it came from a lot of different directions, but one of them, uh, obviously, is the shareholders themselves. <laughs> I mean, you know, why shouldn't they get more money than everybody else? I mean, they've been quite vocal about that, and uh, they've become much more organized as, uh, as the institutional share owning has increased um, over the last um, 50 to 60 years. You know, their voices have become more important and influential in uh, corporate governance. So in 1950, for example, you had 10 percent, roughly, of the largest 1,000 companies were owned by institutional shareholders. By the time you got to the early 2000s, it was closer to 76 percent of the shares held by the top 1,000 companies were owned by institutional shareholders. And also, from 30 years ago in the 80s, um, you had institutional shareholders beginning to organize themselves and to have a more influential voice over corporate governance. So, so yes, they are very influential, and I think that's one of the main, um, you know, uh, 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 advocates for maximizing shareholder wealth. Why shouldn't they advocate for that? Okay. So, I guess I want to take a... <coughs> even more flexible view on what corporate law allows, and there are a couple of other good corporate lawyers in the room. I see Henry Hansman and Lynn Stout, and we'll see if they agree. 
or not. So, um, so I helped to run SSRN. Um, Mike Jensen talked a little bit about SSRN yesterday. Um, I suppose we're trying to maximize the value of the enterprise to scholars. We're certainly not trying to maximize profits. We're trying to bring in enough revenue so we can do interesting things uh, with it. Uh, where is that written in our charter? Well, it's not. Um, what's the fiduciary duty of the board owed? It's, well, it's owed to shareholders. That's us. Um, if we change our mind, or if Mike Jensen changes his mind, then uh, what the board is, would be trying to maximize might change, but as long as we don't, um, uh, not much of a problem. Now, Mike is arranging his estate planning, so he, his, the firm won't have to be sold. He's the majority uh, shareholder. There are two other major shareholders. I'm one of them. Um, uh, but suppose he doesn't, and um, suppose someone decides to sell and pay attention to who the buyer is and not maximize profit. Well, Revlon's a public company doctrine. It's about there are hundreds of dispersed shareholders and their common interest is in maximizing shareholder value. I don't think there's anything in corporate law that's going to stop us from saying we want to pay attention to who the buyer is and what they're going to do with the company um, a a after we sell it. So I, I, th I think you have to understand Revlon is not really an obstacle either outside the public company context, and even then if you put something in the charter, I don't think it would be an obstacle. Um, the board is bound by the charter. Let me see if Henry or Lynn has a different view. Uh, well, Bernd, what do you think about Bart's idea of a, uh, of a different, uh, explicitly different charter? Um, no, no problem if it provides clarity to investors. Right? There's, there's real value in signaling value. It's not that we're changing, creating an option you can't now do. Uh, there might be clarity in that. So I'm certainly not against it. Um, I think the question was, can you do this now? And gee, we think we're doing it now without the Social Benefit Corporation. Uh, Dwight, let me, uh, you sort of made the point that, um, uh, you know, we know we don't, we don't like the world in which uh, you run corporations purely for the benefit of short-term um, share maximization. Um, obviously, we can't. We're not. You're not signing on to a world in which um, uh, corporations are run like nonprofits. So, uh, so we know we don't want to do either of those two things. But um, there's, so there's this big space in the middle. Um, so if you're running a company. Uh, how is it that you decide um, how to balance these things? What are the principles that you would uh, use? Is it, is it only that if it, if it enhances long-term shareholder value, then it's okay, but if it has nothing to do with long-term shareholder value, it's just a nice thing to do for the society, that that's where the line is? Where, uh, where are you, help us, where would you draw the line? Oh, I, I would say that the, the line is probably drawn um, uh, along a couple of dimensions. Uh, one is the primary focus of a CEO, average tenure, three and a half years, uh, is to run the company to maximize shareholder value, maximize the stock price, maximize its profit potential. Uh, so that is the focus. Um, if he's not or she's not focused on that, then um, they will be replaced, right? So. So a CEO is focused on driving price and profitability um, and allowed to do that for as long as the board is willing to accept it. Now, if the board is willing to allow less profit and, and profitability, less stock price and profitability, then it can be taken over, right? So, so the CEO is focused on driving profits, else the board will fire him, or someone, some investment bank will come in and buy them and stop that CEO from doing non-profit maximizing activities. So within that, the, the CEO is allowed to uh, pursue non-profit maximizing activity. So as long as it's not material, it's okay? Effectively, unless, he can t unless the CEO can tie it to, um, this is required to keep my employees happy and engaged, this is required to keep my customers happy and engaged. And so if they can tie it to um, driving shareholder value and convince the board and shareholders that, uh, they can pursue um, 
strat sustainability strategies in a, in a much wider berth. But if they're donating money for you know some some cause or donating corporate resources for some cause that isn't linked to profitability, uh, that is marginal at best. Um, uh, Bernie, I want to go. You you focused on um, sort of investment banks and banks, um, and and particularly in their trading culture and taking advantage um, of their counterparties or their customers. Um, uh, so okay, uh, we we know of examples where that happened. Um, what do you want to do about that? Let me maybe offer what I, you know, let, 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 me, let me go to the board, offer an example, and ask you what you would do about it. Um, what you would do about it starts with recognizing that there's a problem here. Um, what to do about it is harder. Uh, so I'm going to move away from non-prime securities. I'm going to take Jefferson County, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Um, they build a big sewer system. Um, they spend 2.7 billion, and they finance it with municipal bonds, paying a fixed rate of 5.25 percent for some number of years. Perfectly plain vanilla transaction, right? They don't bother with competitive bidding, so they can overpay their investment bank, and maybe they overpay for the interest rate a little bit, but that's the small stuff. Um, uh, we'll see much more. Um, five years go by. In 2002, they do the following. Um, interest rates have dropped, and it's profitable to refinance. They could get a lower fixed rate. But they decide not to directly get a lower fixed rate. Here's what they do. Um, they issue $3 billion in debt. Gee, how did the principal go up if they're just refinancing? Um, of that, 2.2 billion is um, 2.2 billion is auction rates. Um, yeah, that's going to be uh, periodically uh, reissued. <laughs> and have a, a floating interest rate. Well, a floating interest rate doesn't make any sense for this uh, entity. They want a fixed rate so that their sewer rates can be stable. Um, fixed rate makes sense for them, not floating. They actually know this, so they do the following, right? They swap the They agree to pay 4.2% fixed. In return, they're going to get the return on a municipal bond index. Um, and along the way, they're going to pay, oh, maybe $180 million to bankers to do all this, right? Um, way more than they would have paid just to issue normal uh, fixed rate muni debt, for which the fees should be under 1% uh, of the transaction. Um, let's look at this transaction, right? What are they doing? They're paying 42 fixed. And they're also getting the municipal bond index, right? But what happens if the auction rate that they're paying isn't the same as the municipal bond index that they're getting? What they've really got is two things. They're paying 4.2 fixed, and Okay? They're paying 4.2% fixed, and they're paying the spread between the auction rate minus the index. Why would you want to do that? What happens if you get in trouble? What happens to your auction rate? It goes up. Then investors learn that you're in trouble because now you have to pay a higher interest rate and you get in more trouble. The bankers were worried about that, so they wrote into the contract another 277 million penalty clause if the county got downgraded. So we get into a financial crisis. The auction rate goes up, the county gets downgraded, and now they're paying both a very high interest rate on their auction rate securities, and they're supposed to pay 277 million 
uh, to their uh, friendly investment bankers. This, to me, is an example of something that nobody in their right mind would do. But the bankers wined and dined the local officials of Jefferson County, and um, with a direct purpose of making a large fee, and by the way, covering themselves against the risk that they were inflicting on, the, on Jefferson County. Um, it goes on, okay? So Jefferson County then says, gee, these swaps are kind of fun. Um, uh, they, they then do the following uh, transaction. Um, they're going to do this at the scale of 1.8 billion, okay, and pay somewhere between 10 and 30 times the market rate for the swap. Can't quite tell because it's not, it's a custom swap, but clearly massively overpay the investment banks relative to normal swap costs. But I guess they didn't figure that out. Um, here's what they did. They went to pay they agreed to pay 67% of the one month LIBOR rate and they swapped it for 56% of the one month LIBOR rate plus 49 basis points. What possible value could that bring to Jefferson County, right? You're not changing risk. You're still vulnerable. In fact, now what you're vulnerable to is whether interest rates go up or down so that this 11.11% does or doesn't match the 49 basis points. Why do they do this? Um, because they get a $25 million upfront payment, which covers part of the fees that they pay to the investment bankers, um, but they get to record the $25 million as gain because the fees are amortized over the long life of the swamp. That should have told them there was something funky here. Uh, the investment bankers aren't doing this out of generosity. Uh, maybe their expected return on this swap was a loss in the future. And if you try to figure out what the expected loss was using option pricing, the expected loss would have been something like $100 million. Wonderful transaction for the investment bankers um, who profited from the other $75 million that they didn't pay back in the upfront fee, plus their initial fee question is, maybe for the audience, if this is the mindset of the investment banking world and the commercial banking world today, and I think it is, what do we do about it? So you ask me what we do about it, I want to say, here's the problem, and it's not clear what we do about it. Well, are you a big fan of that, uh, you know, of um, uh, Dodd-Frank on steroids regulation in order to deal with this problem, or are you skeptical of that? So, what one would like is, certainly disclosure would help, right? Because then someone could say, this is a darn foolish thing to do. Um, but that would be after the fact, after they've already done it. Maybe they'd get, get, get kicked out of office, but maybe not, because maybe the citizens wouldn't understand mm -hmm. this stuff either. Couldn't hurt. The problem with regulation is it's always looking after the fact. And we can tie business up in a web of regulation, and some of these derivatives are good. And so I would like to find some way to say there's behavior that's bad. Well, what, what, right? about, what about some sort of private action? You know, why can't they be sued for, if this isn't fraud, why don't you redefine fraud so that this would be fraud and then uh, make them subject to suit? Um, you could. That would be a disclosure solution, in effect. You could require better disclosure of the risks. We don't know what disclosures were actually made. One can be reasonably confident that if they were made, they were not, uh, <laughs> that, that they were not well, uh, well understood. Um, in fact, uh, what ends up happening is um, the You all know what happened Jefferson County went bankrupt. Right. Um, the banks decide not to try to collect their $277 million. They do keep their upfront fees. Um, in part, I think, because they were worried about whether the disclosure had been fulsome enough. Who was the lead bank? Uh, there were a bunch of them that, that participated. Um, the lead was some local guy, but um, Bank of America was in on this. Bear Stearns was in on it. Chase was in on it. Um, you know, there were lots of fees to be made by charging 10 or 20 times what you should for interest rate swap. So is this, uh, I, I'll get to some of the rest of you in a minute, but just one final question. So here's one sector which, for whatever reason, 
um, uh, has scummy ethics. Um, okay, so that's one sector. Uh, but what does that have to do with people who uh, make running shoes and make computer chips and, and uh, provide uh, you know, lawn services and uh, uh, accounting services to the rest of the world? Uh, th those are in the real economy. Um, and they don't, they don't operate in this world so much. So uh, why don't, is this a big problem or is this, has it infected the rest of the world? So partly the financial sector does affect the rest of the economy, right? We, th this is part of why we care about the financial sector. Partly, I think that while the financial sector may be more routinely um, uh, capable of this sort of behavior. They're hardly unique. And there, I think there are a lot of areas where if firms are going to try to behave badly, to try to make a buck however they can by fooling their customers, that we're going to end up tied up in a web of regulation. And I'd rather work on how do we get to where this isn't a way that people think about behaving. Or if they think about it, they say, you know what, I don't want to do that. Rather than a world where they think about it and say, yay, we can make some money. Um, Bart, I want to go back to you and ask um, whether any of the companies uh, that have got these new charters mm -hmm. um, are public companies. And I imagine you imagine someday in any case that they, w they will be public. How are they going to deal with the real world of markets and exchanges? you imagine separate exchanges? Uh, how, what, what, what do you imagine in the future for these companies with these different charters? Sure. Uh, so a um, couple things. Uh, first, just going backwards a little bit, I just wanted to address something that Bernie brought up about a Revlon exclusively for public companies. A any company who needs capital, the capital we were just kind of talking about, any company who needs capital to scale has more than one shareholder. And if you have more than one shareholder, at the moment of liquidity, Revlon applies. So certainly it is acute in a public company with a broad base of shareholders. But if Bernie disagreed with his partner in that and said, you got to maximize shareholder value, you can't consider a mission, Bernie would have won in the court of law. So why don't you think so? Majority vote counts. If the majority of the shareholders think this. A ab absolutely. So. I was a private company. We rise, raised private equity to grow. We no longer were majority shareholders. We weren't public. But I didn't have an option at the moment of sale. And that's true of many entrepreneurs who have to raise capital to grow. That's what, my only point, that it is not exclusively an issue around public companies. It, it is around if you need to bring in other shareholders. And, and by the way, I'm curious, uh, I don't know, I, I'm not an attorney, so I shouldn't get into the question of whether you would have a lawsuit that would prevail if they chose a decidedly lower price in the, sell, in the sale as a minority shareholder. Not if I know what I'm getting into up front. I, again, I, I, yep. we, we can agree that there's clarity in the social benefit corporation. I doubt there's anything you couldn't do in the charter if you wanted to in a regular corporation. Um, and again, you know, this is my opinion, but we have some other corporate, uh, corporate scholars in the room, and they can either shake their heads or nod their heads. Can, can you imagine realistically um, that you know, the shares of the companies that uh, are doing what you want them to do um, are going to be bought by anyone other than you know, the Calvert Fund um, and, and some individual investors who have a social conscience? Uh, yes. Ab absolutely. So there was a couple questions you had. The first was, do I envision uh, two exchanges? There are certainly already developing other exchanges for organizations that are really focused on uh, almost exclusively so social purpose, whether it be mission markets, there's one in Hong Kong, there's one in Shanghai. But fundamentally, uh, that's, I don't think, the focus of this room and in, in, in the conversation. The question is around uh, larger organizations that want to go public. Currently, we do not have any public companies. I would Im imagine by the end of two th 2013, we'll have a couple that have uh, gone public. Once you've gone public to, re to become a benefit corporation, the cat's kind of out of the bag, you know, to, to Bernie's point. It, it would be very, very difficult at that juncture, after you've already had an IPO, uh, to 
change, to change the perfect from a C core to a benefit core because you made a promise to all the investors who came in. So un it's very difficult once you've gone public. So most of the companies that are interested in what we're doing are private companies moving towards a public offering. Now with regards to, uh, there is a, I think, a, this is a, this is definitely a, a spectrum of financial opportunities. On one end of the spectrum, there are certainly organizations that are trying to alleviate poverty. In the process, they're going to end up taking some uh, financial haircut because of that social mission. I, I'm pretty sure that everybody in this room would have been happy to invest in Patagonia, uh, the apparel company. Above market margins for 30 some odd years, compound annual growth of, I think, above 20%. Beautifully executed strategy that isn't exclusively about making money. So it really depends where they, they're, uh, where you are on this spectrum. I would imagine that you know there's organizations or people here who would be interested in companies like Whole Foods and others who believe that this piece of being a conscious capitalist actually adds to shareholder value. There's plenty of studies that have demonstrated that if you have strong ESG performance, it actually is a risk mitigator for companies. So I don't, I don't envision Steve long term that this is about two different markets. I believe that this is a, a spectrum of different types of performances, uh, performers in this, in this area. And if, if I was going to point to one thing on your, on your board that I think is most important, it's about transparency. Consumers and investors need to know where you sit on these issues, where the organi how the organization is performing on these issues so they can make educated decisions about patronizing, investing. And they'll range from the great performers like a Patagonia, who very well could be a public company, has it chosen to be, all the way across to organizations who don't give a rat's ass about this. And, and we'll all decide collectively as consumers and investors how we're going to patronize them. And I fundamentally believe that if you create a more transparent society around these issues, there'll be a market that will develop around these issues. Social impact bonds. Social impact bonds. Social what? Social impact bonds. But Social they're not really bonds. bonds. They're, yeah. they're performance yeah. contracts. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I'm sure we all have some opinions on that. My, my two cents, and I'm not an expert on social impact bonds. I don't know a ton about them. My impression is that they're useful, but really limited. It's a really limited case where you're finding the use of a social impact bond is my my modest understanding, but I'll, I'll defer to... No, they're, they're actually not um, bonds. I mean, they're basically performance contracts. Um, they, they started in London. Uh, Bloomberg just did one with Goldman, um, and Massachusetts is trying to raise $50 million, uh, to, to support them. But basically, it is, um, as you said, it is a contract to deliver a service, and you get paid uh, if the service delivers the outcome. And a lot of the focus is on things like recidivism in, in, in right. prisons because the cost of recidivism is so high um, that you can you can see a, a huge benefit if you keep somebody from going to jail. So um, current social services aren't working as well as, as um, politicians would like. Private sector, third party, or third sector folks feel like they can do a better job. And so it's basically an outsourced contract to, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we just uh, we uh, supported a, uh, a competition at Harvard last year where there's a firm called Instiglio. Uh, very interesting concept they had, which is, uh, and it, it helps break, break a, a, a chicken and egg situation. Uh, the reason why we awarded them the, the innovation prize was that um, in developing countries um, in particular, all the money towards HIV goes to treatment, um, where uh, prevention is obviously a better route mm -hmm. and a cheaper route, like a hundred mm -hmm. times cheaper route. But if you're a health minister, if you're spending money on prevention, nobody sees it, and all you see are people in the hospital. And so if they've got a billion dollars to spend, they're going to spend it in hospitals where people can see it, where a billion dollars spent on prevention would actually empty the hospital bed. So what, there's a conundrum. You can't spend the money. And so when Stiglio came up with the idea and using investment banking techniques is we'll raise a billion dollars, we'll invest it in prevention, and then when your bed's empty in the future, pay us from the billion dollars you were going to spend 10 years from now, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll make a market rate off of it. And so, Bernie, Bernie, investment bankers aren't all bad. <laughs> Just the ones with the heart. <laughs> They're not all bad. All right, other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what do you think would be the consequences of this? Uh, barring investment banks from using the corporate form, so that institutional investors aren't getting constant pressure for them to maximize short term share price, so that that's not constantly undermining professional norms that they can use. So using financial reform to help shore up the uh, so and, so and so the partners are also on the hook right. personally for. Right. I mean, that's another point of it, but this would also... Right. So, so the, the problem is that a lot of the things that, um, a lot of financial transactions require capital and you have to raise the capital. And I think that's what pushed uh, the investment banks to go public fundamentally, and I don't see that turning around. So there may be situations where um, private capital is sufficient, but there are going to be a lot where there are not. So I'm not excited by that. Um, you know, more disclosure could help. Uh, I think the disclosure of the de by corporations of the derivatives transactions that they enter into is remarkably opaque. Um, a question would be what did Procter & Gamble disclose before uh, this situation blew up in their face? I can tell you what Jefferson County disclosed, which was virtually nothing. Um, the public disclosure is worse than the private disclosure here. Um, that would certainly help. And then the question you want to ask is, suppose you have um, this transaction publicly disclosed. Right? I'm not saying take away the power of the county to enter into it, although I might think about that if I had a sensible way to say, don't do anything fancy, just do the simple stuff. You're less likely to be fooled. I might like that too. Um, would this be a political platform that someone could run on saying, you dumb fools, elect me instead, and we're still stuck with it, but I won't do anything equally dumb in the future? Um, would that be a successful platform? Would it be a likely one? Would that be a sufficient no. response? No, it wouldn't, because some, the, 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 
county commissioners would simply say, Goldman Sachs said it was good. Um, and who said, you know, who, who are you to say it was bad? You don't even understand those things, and you would lose the election. <laughs> uh, other questions? I think it's a I think it's a reasonable concern. Uh, uh, fundamentally, I I do think it's wor worth stating that the benefit core legislation is for a relatively. This is not going to be used for all corporations. It's intended for an organization that has at least a dual purpose, right? A company that's both trying to make money and make a difference with their business. Uh, I agree with Donna and with Lynn and others that the business judgment rule works quite effectively for regular organizations to consider the long-term prospects of the organization and consider other stakeholders other than just shareholder value. So our intent isn't to demean that particular issue. It's trying to create a separate vehicle for w where the long-term profit, profit maximization is not the sole intent of the company. <laughs> The company's trying to do something beyond. So the business judgment rule, again, my novice understanding, says you can consider a lot of things as long as sometime in the future it might accrue value back to the shareholder. And, and, and that, might be, that might be wrong, but that's my, my novice understanding. And what we're saying is that there are companies who today want to make a decision that isn't about shareholder value. And for them, that's why we're making this new corporate forward. For them who are trying to do beyond profit maximization, something beyond that particular focused uh, objective, this is a different, a different path. <laughs> You've heard pretty clearly from the legal experts in the room that the claim that somehow C corporations have some sort of obligation to maximize profits for shareholders is not accurate. Mm -hmm. And I would say, by the way, by pushing that claim, it makes B-Lab look less than trustworthy. So if I were you, I would like leave that like a hot potato, because you've got a much better marketing opportunity. And it starts from this. I am pleased to report based on a decade of extensive study that most people are not social mm -hmm. This has been proven. 97% of people in the right social context will make at least a marginal sacrifice to avoid hurting others. In other words, 97% of investors, if it were phrased to them this way, look, you can make a 4% return investing in companies that make profits by polluting the environment, exploiting workers, producing bad products. Or you can make a 3.9% annual return from investing in companies that we, the trustworthy B-Lab folks, have determined provide a net benefit to society. So what I would like to see you do is change the social context so that when people go into the investing world, they go, invest in, they go into that investing decision with their morals accurate. Mm -hmm. Endless data shows that even though 97% of us are not sociopaths, we act like certain sociopaths. We act like sociopaths when the social framing tells us it's okay, when we're buying a used car or picking a stock portfolio, and we act like nice people when the social context tells us we should be nice at a wedding reception mm -hmm. or, say, a conference. So I'm going to give you a gift card. Here, I am being generous. <laughs> Advertisement saying, Are you a psychopathic investor? <laughs> 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 or are you a social 
Well, Thank part you. Part of the problem is that uh, somebody, I think, said 70% of our money is invested by sociopaths on our behalf. <laughs> yes, sir. If you insert into the charter of the C Corporation that we're going to do so this way, it's part of the charter, why then is there a need for a B Corporation? Is there other elements in terms of the governance practices? What's the benefit? That's what I'm not hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I add, are you saying if you were to insert in the charter, you mean of a new company, or go back to to uh, the uh, charter of General, General Motors and insert that? It's got to be a new company. Okay. Because the big corporations are going to be incorporated. Okay. Or, you know, if you're going to take an existing company and convert it to a big corporation, it would be the same situation. I think um, absolutely you can do that with a C corporation. You want to form a new corporation, you want to say one of your purposes is you know, to do social good, you can do that, absolutely. You don't need a different form to do that. <laughs> so, again, I feel a little outgunned. <laughs> Say it out loud. My, my understanding is that you can insert that charter, and if you, and, and this is where I'm not, again, I'm not sure with Bernie, but my understanding is that at the moment when you're selling the company, you no longer can consider that charter in the sale. At the moment of the sale, my understanding is that you must, it, it is, so my question is, if you have two offers on the table, okay. one well, offer is higher than the other, how, how about this? We, we do have some genuine corporate yeah, law experts them. in the room. I am okay, one of I... them. Lynn is another. Henry is a third. You should go back to your corporate counsel and we should move to a different topic. Yeah. Okay. okay. question is that they can show data showing they are as good if not better whether that's true or not that's the data that they've been able to selectively find the question I can just tell you that they are an infinitesimal part of the market mm -hmm. and they've been around a long time so I get, I think the larger question on that is what if, if, it, if, if that's what we want and they're available why isn't the Calvert fund bigger than fidelity and it isn't it's, it's like this well, that's, that's, I mean, that, that is the point, right? I mean, shareholder value, especially, you know, if you're a single shareholder or the majority shareholder, what you value is money and maybe something else, a social good. But if you are thousands of people, then it basically reduces down to what you value is economic returns, period. And so, so all the markets, all of it just focus solely on that one thing, which is, the company is there to make money. Now, I separate it from what was described here, which, you know, I'm a simple guy, uh, is selling a bad product, right? I mean, you know, they sold a bad product that was way overpriced. Um, and, you know, whether it's that or soap or whatever, you shouldn't sell bad products that are way overpriced. Um, and, and so, with, from the market standpoint, shareholder value is just reducibly, you know, economic return. Um, it, especially when it's dispersed um, shareholders, because they can't agree on anything. I mean, you, getting three people to agree what mm -hmm. is valuable aside from economic return, uh, it would be an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yesterday, Brady King talked about the radical flake effect. The radical? Radical flake effect? Flake. 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 Flake.
and and I, I guess I can't help but think that that's a three four. I I didn't hear the radical flank effect, <laughs> so I can't comment. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Which is basically that um, it, uh, more mainstream activist organizations that are working with uh, corporations need some radical flank yeah. out on the uh, be out there in order to agitate for something so that they can right. change the so, social norm. Right. They don't have to be successful. In, in, in a legal sense, they're successful in changing the social norm. So, um, so based on that quick description, description that's certainly our, our hopeful intent, is that w Walmart and BP are not going to be certified B corporations or benefit corporations. Okay? What we're trying to demonstrate is that there is a successful set of the market who has investors, consumers, and entrepreneurs who've created a vehicle that's succeeding. And in the process, through demonstration effect, have others move more towards greater transparency and better clarity around social and environmental impact of their businesses. That's the core theory of change of, of B Lab. Well, because you had for a million shareholders to have in aggregate socially conscious objectives, not profit maximization. How would you get them to agree what that is, and how would you measure it, right, and report it? So. systems um, uh, direct, uh, encourage and incent um, corporate executives um, to overemphasize short-term share price. And uh, is that an important uh, solution? Here? I, I think executive compensation systems is an important solution, both to the, the financial issues that Bernie talked about. Uh, as well as to just general corporate governance. Uh, and the reason for that, I think, is um, we've, we've gone over a period of 30 years where we started out with, back in, I think it was 1984, uh, corporate CEOs uh, were compensated solely in cash. And then came along this, this concept that, you know, that, that corporate managers should align their interests with the shareholders. And so the concept of having stock options came into being. And so if I recall the statistics right, somewhere around 1984, um, it, we began to, uh, public corp corporations began to give uh, CEOs and, and senior management uh, stock options. But instead of decreasing the, the cash, <laughs> the stock options were just an add-on on top of the cash. And there were a lot of policy support for that. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, the federal government decided in the tax code to limit the deductions for cash contributions or cash compensation if it were a million dollars. So, so similar to what the Swiss are doing nowadays, uh, the U.S. Um, years ago decided to limit uh, compensation. What that did was push compensation into stock. So in the year 2001, I believe it was, uh, the last time I saw the statistics on it, 66% of compensation to CEOs was in the form of stock. 
And at that same period of time, you had, uh, during that same 30-year period, you had uh, CEOs being compensated at about 140 times the average worker. Now you have CEOs being compensated 500 times the average worker. So you've got these phenomena going on where CEOs' interests are tied to shareholders' interests. And you know the question is, is it too much? Or not quantitatively, is it, is it compensation too much, but is the tie too close? So in answer to that to your question, two things. Number one, if in fact the stock price is largely determined by a relatively small number of investors who trade a lot so that the non-psychopathic investor, the long-term investor, sits there and does nothing and basically has very little effect on the stock price. But the stock price on any sort of short or medium-term basis is determined by the trading among the psychopaths. And then the incentive of the CEO is tied to the trading of the psychopath. Then you've, you've created an, an unfortunate net, uh, nexus there where, um, of, where all the psychopaths get to control the thing and people who might make the decision to invest in a 3.9 as opposed to a 4% return, well, they're just sitting there holding, you know, holding, holding their shares, and they they become they've made themselves irrelevant. Right. Um, the operating board is a dysfunctional operating board in the history of the mass market because basically the abuses come as a, as a maximizing mm -hmm. uh, that, that, you know, when you, not when you go out to get a. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I have a question. I mean, to the panel, how does this effort that the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which is going to create equal valuation of economic, social, governance factors with the valuation of, of economic, traditional factors, how will that change this dialogue in terms of creating metrics and measures that are valued uh, through a rigorous process to get to the place where the economic, social, and governance are equal valuation to the profit, return on investment. Pardon. So, uh, uh I don't know your name. I'm sorry. What 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 this gentleman's referring to is SASB. SASB is a uh, uh, an effort to try to identify within each industry uh, a set of metrics that best uh, describe the most important social and environmental uh, elements of that particular industry. Uh, their efforts from there are to focus on um, leaders in each industry to adopt these and include them. Uh, and their 10K as their report. And from there, uh, the hope is to work with the SEC to make it a requirement. I think it's a, I think it's a beautiful <laughs> objective, and uh, I think that type of transparency will be hugely impactful where uh, all financial reports of public companies would include just not financial performance, but also the five, six, seven most important metrics measuring social and environmental impact. We're, we're, we're big fans of SASB, think it's a great innovation. I think they have a, uh, uh, an enormous challenge, and, and we're completely supportive. And I think it would make a big, big difference. Well, um, it's 10 o'clock, and I'm going to um, uh, take our poll again and see if we've changed any minds. Mm -hmm. uh, I could do that two ways. I could ask anyone if they changed their mind, and, and that might be the most efficient way. So. Uh, did anyone change their mind as a result of this conversation today? Anyone want to change? You want to go from where to where? Well, obviously, I'm going to social norms. Okay. <laughs> okay, where were you? I was actually, I cheated. I was in regulation and disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any, anyone else want to change their mind? I didn't vote, but I want to go to social norms. You want to go to social norms, okay. To nine. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Uh, see you in, what, 15 minutes or so? Thank you. I enjoyed it.